The Dahomey Amazons were an all-female army called the Agoji. They first appeared in written history in 1729 until the downfall of Dahomey by the French in 1896. The Dahomey was notoriously known for their barbaric slave raids, mass human sacrifices and trophies in the form of decapitated heads. They thrived for war and bloodshed. Some women soldiers were recruited from free Dahomeyan women who enrolled voluntarily to have position and wealth. Fathers or husbands who were displeased with their daughter or wife's behaviour would complain to the king, resulting in the daughter or wife being involuntarily enrolled to become an agoji. It was also not uncommon for foreign captives to be forced to become agoji warriors. Children were forcefully enrolled, with some starting training from as young as 8 years old. Training was brutal and made the women warriors to be emotionless killing machines. The Ogoji were the leaders of the slave raids. They would ravage and burn down peaceful neighboring villages. Most women and children would be captured and sold into slavery through the Atlantic slave trade. Most men and the elderly would be killed. The Ogoji would remove the heads off the bodies and bring them to their king as war trophies. Any woman that refused to conduct mass slave raids or the killing and beheading of people would be captured themselves, sold into slavery or executed by the king. Each Ogoji warrior kept slaves of their own. They would be paid by their king for every slave captured and for every decapitated head. Please consider subscribing to my channel and hitting that like button, it would really help me out. According to the slavery archival logs, the Dahomey were responsible for the capture and sale of over 440,000 people. This makes one third of the African slaves that were sent to slave ships during the Atlantic slave trade. It is true that the Dahomeys fought for their freedom against the Oyo Empire. After being invaded by and losing in warfare in 1730, Dahomey was forced to make annual payments to oil in the form of slaves as their taxes. This although did not mean that the Dahomey did not prosper, the Dahomey was making a fortune off the capture and sale of slaves even during the rule of the oil empire. The business of slavery is what brought Dahomey most of its wealth. In 1832, King Gezo's Dahomey army defeated oil and became an independent empire. Gezo was king of the Dahomey from 1818 to 1858 and was known for his military reform. During Gezo's reign, the Ogoji became a significant part of the Dahomeyan military, expanding from roughly 600 women to as many as 6,000 and while colonization by the Europeans was indeed a concern, this didn't escalate until several years after the King Gezo's reign. While Portugal's demand for slaves in Brazil increased in 1830, the British started a campaign to abolish the slave trade in Africa. The British government ended slavery in 1835 and began putting significant pressure on King Gezo in the 1840s to end the slave trade in Dahomey. King Gezo responded to these requests by saying he was unable to end the slave trade because of domestic pressure and said, quote, The slave trade is the ruling principle of my people. It is the source and the glory of their wealth. The mother lulls the child to sleep with notes of triumph over an enemy reduced to slavery." Unquote. The Dahomeys did not just sell war captives through the slave raids. They captured and sold people from peaceful neighboring villages. Those who weren't sold or killed were kept for annual human sacrificing. A minimum of 500 captives would be used for annual custom sacrifices. It is told 4,000 captives were beheaded as a celebration for a new reigning king. Human sacrifices were also conducted when a new agoji was recruited. When a reigning king died, they would sacrifice thousands of captives. King Gezo proposed an expansion of palm oil trade and a gradual abolishment of the slave trade. They stopped selling slaves through the Atlantic slave trade but still conducted slave raids, capturing free people to work in their fields for their palm oil trade. The Egbas of Abiyakuta, the new Yoruba people, who did not participate in slavery, had become the new palm oil capital of the region, which became King Gezo's competition. In 1851, King Gezo attacked Abiyakuta, but failed to overthrow them, and since palm oil was no longer a lucrative option, King Gezo continued to trade slaves even though the British now made it illegal to deport slaves through the Atlantic slave trade. They continued to trade slaves within Africa until the French overthrew the Dahomey Empire in 1894. The Dahomey would get up to $60 per slave, which would be around $2,279 today. Francisco Felix de Souza, born 1754 and died 1849, was a Brazilian slave trader. He helped Gezo ascend to the throne in 1818 in a coup, which meant to overthrow a current reigning king. He became Chacha to King Gezo. 
D'Souza was a major slave trader and merchant who traded in palm oil, gold and slaves, and is known as the greatest slave trader. Trading slaves from what was then the Dahomey region continued to market slaves after the trade was abolished. In most jurisdictions, he was apparently so trusted by the locals in Dahomey that he was awarded the status of a chieftain. King Glele succeeded his father, King Gezo, and ruled from 1858 to 1889. Despite the formal end of the slave trade and its interdiction by the Europeans, he continued slavery. His fields were primarily cared for by slaves, and slaves became a major source of messengers to his ancestors in ceremonies meaning sacrificial victims. In 1860, he met with William Foster, captain of the American ship Clotilda, the final ship to illegally take slaves to the United States. The last slave ship, Clotilda, that left the homey seas illegally transporting 115 African slaves in 1860 to America, 50 years after the slave trade was outlawed. Most of them were peaceful people who were taken from their homes. Many were children as young as two years old. It is said, if anyone in America is a descendant from an African slave, your ancestor was most likely captured and sold by the Dahomey Empire. Three American freed slaves were interviewed long after their emancipation so that their stories could be told. Cujo Lewis The book Barracoon, the story of the last black cargo, is a non-fiction work by Zora Neale Hurston. It is based on her interviews in 1927 with Cujo Lewis, a living survivor of the Atlantic slave trade. Cujo's story is of the most descriptive. Cujo Lewis was born Aluele Kosola in 1841 in the West African country currently known as Benin. He was a member of the Yoruba people, more specifically the Isha, a Yoruba subgroup, whose traditional home is in the Bante region of eastern Benin. Lewis's father was Aluwale and his mother Fondlolu. He had five full siblings and twelve half-siblings through his father's other two wives. In April of 1860, at the age of 19, his village was attacked and Lewis was taken prisoner by female warriors led by King Glele of Dahomey. Along with other captives, he was taken to the slaving port of Kouda and sold to Captain William Foster of the Clotilda. Kujo Lewis's interview describes his experiences from being captured and enslaved by the Dahomey Amazons. The Dahomey king would raise taxes knowing the villagers couldn't pay. The Dahomeys came to Kujo's village, Tukoi, requesting for resources and to give up their crop and grain, extorting them for their property and food. Kujo recounts that the Dahomeys were notorious for ravaging neighboring villages, forcing them to put up a flag. A red flag meant that they were refusing requests and would rather fight for their freedom. The white flag meant to give in and turn over whatever the Dahomeys want, including people for the slave market. And a black flag meant their leader has fallen and there is no one leading their village. The Dahomeys preferred trophies in the form of chief and king's heads and so they wouldn't feel it was worth their time. The Dahomey soldiers said that if they do not hand over what is requested, that there will be war. The Tokoi king insisted that the crops were for his people and if King Glele wanted crops, he could grow them himself. One night Kujo's village was asleep. The Dahomey army broke through their gates. Kujo explains that he woke up and saw Dahomey women soldiers with French guns and machetes. The elderly people were trying to get away, but the Ogoji were grabbing them by their hair and cutting off their heads off their bodies. They swept through the village capturing children. They tore off the jawbones of the people's faces, heard their horrid screams of agony. Kujo explains that the Dahomey army surrounded his entire village and he tried to get away but was captured and tied up. They also captured the Tokoi king and took him to King Glele, who was waiting on the outskirts of the village. At King Glele's orders, a woman Agoji took a machete and cut off the king's head and handed it to the Dahomey king. Kujo explains that he couldn't see his mother or father anywhere, nor any of his siblings. He begged to know what happened to them, but he was ignored and tied in line with the other captured people. While they walked back to Dahomey, the Ogoji had two to three heads each of his people with them. Kujo could smell the stench of death all the way back to Dahomey. When they arrived at the Dahomey kingdom, the king's home was made out of skull bones. Fresh and decomposed heads were placed on large sticks all around. They were then transported to the oceanside slaving port of Kuida. Kujo says he recalls a big white house with many slaves waiting to be put onto ships. 
This was the first time Cujo had ever seen a white man. This man, Captain William Foster, chose 130 slaves, including Cujo. He paid the Dahomey and they were rounded up to be put onto the Clotilda ship. Matilda McCreer Matilda Bornabake was a member of the Yoruba people. Her village was attacked in a raid by the Dahomeys, who killed her father. She and her mother and sisters were captured from their home and taken to the slave port of Kuida in present-day Benin. There, Captain William Foster and his crew illegally purchased her family and over 100 others to traffic into Alabama on the Clotilda. Once in Alabama, a prominent slave owner named Memorable Walker Creer purchased Matilda, her mother and her 12-year-old sister, to work on his plantation. Her two older sisters went to another plantation and she never saw them again. Radoshi Radoshi, renamed Sally Smith, is the older sister of Matilda McCreer. She was kidnapped alongside her sisters and mother. After memorable Walker Creer bought Matilda and her mother Gracie, Radoshi was forced to become a child bride before being sold again, this time around to Washington Smith, owner of the Bogue Cheeto Plantation near Selma and also the co-founder of the Bank of Selma. Two of the Dahomey people who had kidnapped Radoshi and her family were also taken captive for reasons unknown and transported to North America on the same slave ship. They worked alongside Radoshi in the fields and she never forgave them. Captain William Foster blew up the Clotilda slave ship to remove the evidence. To this day, Clotilda lies at the bottom of the ocean. The Dahomeys, Captain William Foster and his ship destroyed millions of lives.